Yeah, the person lying there like the dead? That's me, Elara. My eyes flutter open, but the headache behind them still sits heavy in my skull. I groan, pain throbbing through my temples as I lift one hand to rub at my forehead. I shift around, feeling stiff. The sterile smell of antiseptic mingling with an unwashed odor clings to my skin, assaulting my nostrils. I struggle to sit up, the scratchy hospital gown shifting and crinkling around me. Confusion clouds my thoughts. What is going on here? Where am I? My fingers brush something bulky beneath my gown. What the heck? A diaper. Humiliation and dread surge through me. How did I end up here? Gritting my teeth, I straighten and swing my legs over the edge of the bed. My naked bare feet touch the cold tile floor. Scanning the room, I notice how bare it is. Clinical. Just a bed and a simple dresser. My gaze lands on a wall calendar. The year 2027 stares back at me. No. 2027? How can it be? My heart races. I look down at my hands, staring at unfamiliar wrinkles on my appendages. I jump up, stumbling to a small bathroom off to my left. My body! Flicking on the harsh fluorescent light, I stare at my reflection. Bruised-looking dark circles under my eyes, long tangled hair. A stranger looks back. What happened to me? The unfamiliar reflection offers no answers. Just a haunting image of despair across her face. Tears blur my vision. I am just a stale shadow of my former self. I'm lost in a time I don't belong to. Determined to make sense of this, or at least reach out for help. I return to the dreary hospital-like room, yanking open the dresser drawers one by one until I find my phone. Yes, here we go. It feels like a lifeline. Relief crashes over me, draining the burst of adrenaline that poisoned my emotions just moments before. I hit the power button, but the screen remains empty. No signal, no messages, no calls. Panic claws at my chest as the fear rushes back tenfold. I have no contact, no familiar faces, no connection to the outside world, no way to get help. A wave of dizziness envelops me and overwhelms my vision. I crumple to the floor, unconsciousness once again pulling me back into its dark embrace. Sometime later, I awoke and stared, unblinking at the ceiling, trying to wrap my head around the situation. What the heck should I do now? Is there anyone I can trust? I've not seen anyone, but I somehow ended up in this bed again. I shut my eyes tight, trying to will a next step to pop into my brain. But then, I heard what sounded like high-heeled footsteps confidently approaching, gaining speed as though excited to enter the room. Cautious and scared of who might come through the door, I decided to appear lifeless. I lay completely still, feigning sleep, unsure of what or who to expect. The door swung open and the whoosh of air hit me across the face. Breathe steady, Lara. Just in and out, slowly, no twitching. The footsteps had stopped right next to where I lay. Sweat gathered in my clammy palms underneath the covers of the bed. A shadowy figure strangely terrifying looms over me. I can feel the tension exuding from the woman. You thought you'd have it all, huh? You don't deserve it. My heart kicks into high gear. That's Mara, my best friend. The bitterness in Mara's words stings. Stay calm, Alara. Keep breathing. Don't move. I don't understand. There has to be an explanation. There has to be. My mind races, scrambling for any motivation behind Mara's hateful words. Oh, this is just the beginning. Watch what I do to you. You've been asleep so long. <laughs> You're not even pretty anymore. I'll take all your money, too. My blood runs cold. Chills crawl up my spine like icy fingernails at the tone of her voice. My heart sinks. Where is this hate coming from? The betrayal from Mara hurts deeply, even more than if she had stuck a knife into my chest. After Mara leaves, I sit up again, my shoulders slumping, bent over, drained emotionally, still unclear about where I was and how Mara was connected to it all. I contemplated my surroundings and my past. Suddenly, the memory zoomed to the front of my mind as though I had called them by name. Dear Journal, I met this charming man, James, today. We literally bumped into each other at the park. I was getting a light jog in and he was walking his dog. His wonderful smile and friendly demeanor were the balm on my daily grind. 
He's so approachable and asked me out by the end of our conversation. I am so grateful I went out jogging today as Mara suggested. Dear Journal, James took me to the most romantic restaurant tonight. It was all red drapes and crisp white tablecloths and low light. He even ordered a chocolate dessert for both of us to share. He impressed me. Maybe he is the man I'm meant to be with. Maybe I should share the rest of my life with him. I had my doubts before, but after dinner, when he took me to the park where we met and got down on one knee, I squealed with delight and caved. Yes, yes, I will marry you. Dear Journal, my perfect wedding. It wouldn't have happened at all if it wasn't for the support of my new husband, James, and my best friend, Mara. I am more than blessed to have such wonderful, supportive, loving people in my life. One night while I was relaxing at home with James, I took the drink James offered me. Admiring the way my wedding ring glinted off the light as I extended my left hand to grasp the cup. The liquid in the cup was darker than my usual brand, but I shrugged it off as a trick of the light. Then after a full, healthy gulp, I look over to James. However, James's outline begins to blur. My vision retreats, and I fall limp to the floor. No! 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 James! Mara! You fooled me! Both of you! Mara! I helped you gain that cushy position at work! I even personally recommended you to the CEO! James! Why didn't you tell me you had known Mara before? I suspected, but I could never prove it! You were both so good about hiding this! Competing at work was just a game to humiliate me? Our marriage was a scam? Did either of you love me even a tiny bit? My eyes fill with horror as I sit up straight and realization strikes me like a physical blow to my head. My hands grip the blanket covering my lap. A tear slowly drips down my face and splashes against the back of my hand. The second one falls just inches from the first, soaking into the soft blanket. I felt like such a fool. It was all a lie. You helped me. You never saw how much I hated you. My head jerks up and turns toward the doorway. Mara stands in the doorway, cold and triumphant. I thought you might be pretending to sleep. Now everything you have, <laughs> excuse me, had, is mine. I trembled with anger as the reality of the betrayal and helplessness surged through me. Tears of anger and sorrow flow freely, now sliding down my cheeks as though a dam holding them back had finally crumbled. I trusted you! I believed in us! Our friendship! Mara steps closer, eyes gleaming with malice. And that's what made it so easy. Seeing the hatred displayed nakedly on Mara's face clearly for the first time made me clench my fists harder, wrinkling the blanket and the lines of despair on my face. I wasn't going to let this stand! This was unacceptable. I would never be a victim, not especially to these two, whom I loved despite all that they had done. I turned to face Mara, determination pushing past my devastation. You'll never win. Smiling darkly, Mara responded, quietly leaning in, trying to intimidate me. I could feel her hot breath in my face. I already have. Mara confidently spun on her Prada heels and left with a parting condescending wave without even looking back. Many hours later, after Mara was gone and the nurses had given me more painkillers, her exiting footsteps echoing off the sterile walls of the hospital still bounced around in my thoughts. Then, something in me just snapped. I wasn't going to be a victim. I wasn't going to let them do whatever they wanted. I was going to fight back. My life wasn't the only one they would ruin if I didn't stand firm against this kind of maliciousness. I won't let them win. I won't be a victim. With significant effort from my underused and sluggish body, I pushed myself up, determined that this would be the last time I lay helpless in this hospital bed. My body protested from all the violent movement and the heavy recovery drugs the doctors had me on. I stumbled toward the door, my mind racing with ideas and action, building a plan in my mind. My future was still up to me to take care of. No one can define it for me. I slowly creeped along the silent hallway, all of my senses on high alert, waiting for a nurse or doctor to stop me. I didn't have time for any of this. I was leaving this place of broken people, now. I don't know who else is in on Mara's scheme, but I can't be caught investigating. I'll need help to expose the truth. 
I sped up as my thoughts solidify and grasp a hold of my plan. Who to call and who to schedule time with settles in my mind like warm, comforting coffee first thing in the morning. My head clears and I pick up the pace once again. Shadowy corridors and locked doors blur by. Each step is a new battle against the recovery drugs and the heavy burden of the tasks ahead. But my resolve keeps me moving, faster and faster. Finally, I spot an exit. I dash to the door and shove against it with all my weight and determination behind it. The heavy steel door squeals on its hinges as it's pushed open wide. I step one foot out into the night. The crisp, cool air is a welcome relief. I can do this. One step at a time, I can do this. The moon shines brightly down, illuminating my face. The breeze once again blows toward me through my hair, rustling the full hospital gown around my body. A welcome relief as my first task, getting out of the pitiful mindset trapped in that hospital bed, is complete. I stand in front of a mirror with my older and hopefully wiser face looking back at me. My reflection does show signs of the ordeal, but a new flinty strength is shining in my eyes. I'll expose Mara and James. I'll take back my life and dignity, and I'll make sure they pay for every ounce of suffering. Justice will be served. I was surprised, but the authorities believed me. I told them the whole sordid tale using my diary as a crude outline of the timeline of events. Mara and James are temporarily behind bars. Now I need to ensure they stay there. The legal battles are just beginning, but I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready. Then I took one more approving look at my reflection, turned and stepped away from the mirror, satisfied with my presentation. I no longer looked or felt like a victim. I was determined things would change and justice would occur. I've lost much, but gained something invaluable, a deeper understanding of my strength. The scars remind me of my resilience. When I arrived, the courtroom was buzzing with activity. Everyone had tense, low conversations and opinions on the situation, and specifically this court case. I walked in, flanked by my trusted lawyer and paralegal. We'd done so much prep for this. I knew we were ready. Reporters jostle one another for a glimpse of me, vying for a photo of my repose as I entered the accusatory chambers of the legal system. With my head held high and my shoulders relaxed in a confident stance, I lower myself into the chair behind the prosecutor's designated area. I'm ready to face my tormentors. Mara and James were sitting at the defense table, matching expressions of arrogance and unease etched in their faces. I met Mara's gaze for just a moment and noticed immediately my former friend's eyes were unrestrained, cold and calculating, no longer the warm, inviting childhood friend I had come to depend on through the years. A small shiver runs down my spine, but it was a mere hint of the icy fingernails that overtook me that day in the hospital. I held Mara's intense gaze while her eyes burned hotter with anger that initially was frightening. I realized she was angry because she was no longer in control. She no longer had the power over me she once did. I met her eyes and didn't look away. It's a little amusing that Mara and James still can't comprehend how their plan unraveled. They were pompous. They were overconfident. The trial progressed each day, a grueling test of my resolve. I took the stand and recounted my whole ordeal, reliving the nightmare in front of everyone. However, I held my composure and stated the facts. No need for outward emotional displays. The evidence speaks for itself. The prosecution presented hard evidence, bank statements, emails, testimonies, that painted a damning picture of Mara and James' conspiracy. Mara's lawyer tried hard to discredit me, suggesting I was a willing participant. My anger flared and my emotions surged. I remained composed, answering each question with clarity. Even though inside I was crying and lamenting that they had done this to me and I had, indeed, fallen for it. I won't let them twist the truth. My lawyer's closing argument condemned Mara and James. She talked about how kind I had been to Mara both before and after the conspiracy was uncovered. I had unwavering support for James and our wedding vows, how I had stayed faithful and steadfast. Then she reminded the jury about the ultimate betrayal that shattered my world. My lawyer's words resonated with the jury, who looked over at me one by one with sympathy and admiration for all I had endured. I'm stronger than ever, and no one will ever take that from me again. I lock eyes with Mara's one last time. This time, there's triumph and closure in my gaze.
The jury foreman stands. We all wait on bated breath. Guilty on all counts. While Mara and James were shocked, I was already content. I had testified and told my story and explained everything that had happened. I faced my demons. As they are led away in handcuffs, I find myself sad that Mara and I ended this way. She has changed so much, and I just didn't know her anymore. Who she has become was not a healthy friend, not a healthy person. I was relieved justice was served, but sad it took all of this to expose our failing relationships. My ex-husband James met my eyes, guilt and remorse playing across his features, warring with the brutal unbelief on his face that I would defend myself. After exiting the courthouse, reporters swamped around me and my legal team, cameras flashing and questions flying at me. How do you feel? What will you do now? Do you have any plans for the money you've gotten back? All of these were questions I wasn't entirely sure I could answer. Not until I knew for sure myself. I stepped up to the microphones. <clears throat> Thank you all for your support. Betrayal wounds are deep, and I'm sure all of you have experienced some form of it in your lifetime. But we must be strong and not treat ourselves as victims. We must not treat ourselves the way our betrayers would. I implore you to stand against injustice and reclaim your life. No one is a victim if they can face their accusers with calm facts. Um, thank you. I stepped down from the podium, hoping my little impromptu message sunk in for them as much as it followed me home. I'm not sure where the words came from, but they were true for me. Calm and factual. As I gazed out at the city from my balcony, I spent some time breathing in the cool night air. Similar to the moment I exited the hospital, the moon looked down at me and the breeze played with the strands of my hair. I exhaled the deep breath from my lungs and sighed. I think I can do even more. I went inside and drug out a bunch of unorganized photos. I started sorting through them and putting them into different boxes. One box for past and one for present. I came across one of me and Mara smiling, holding each other. With my heart aching, I placed it in the box labeled past. I will heal. I regularly go to my therapist and decided to tell her how I was feeling anxious. A little unsettled, like I wasn't sure this was all done, even though all the justice was served. I cried a bit, but then the therapist made a delightful suggestion. My sorrow-filled tears morphed into tears of relief as the new idea took form in my mind. I commonly have my family and friends over, supporting them the way they supported me during and after the trial. But the suggestion the therapist made still played through my thoughts, giving me the motivation to spread my journey of healing to others. I started a non-for-profit foundation that supports the legal costs for victims who don't want to be victims anymore. We called it No Victims Here, and we have raised over $10 million over the years, sharing my story and sharing each other's journeys toward healing. I spent years supporting others. My decision to never be a victim inspired others to never be a victim. As I excitedly step outside the most recent money-raising gig into the blazing sunset and look up towards the horizon, feeling an insurmountable peace and fulfillment, I will constantly walk toward a healing future, never to allow victimhood to penetrate my peace again. No matter what battle or betrayal comes my way, there are no victims here.